So this is a radiator laser synthesizer. And uh, as you can see across here, we've got a bunch of IO on the backside. We've got power. We've got audio inputs for automating uh, radiator response to audio. We've got a series of mini jacks for uh, control voltage, which represents the data from the low frequency oscillators. And these are uh, control voltage in and out. Uh, we also have an XY out. This is fantastic for driving things like oscill oscilloscopes or VectorX or uh, other uh, video synthesis equipment. We've got a standard DB25 ILDA connector. So you can hook the radiator directly to laser projectors without having to use external DACs if you don't want to. Uh, we have uh, MIDI in and MIDI out, and these are actual MIDI DIN connectors. Uh, we've got a micro USB connector, and uh, we've got standard USB connector uh, for driving things like laser dock DACs um, and for features down the road. Uh, we have here a uh, standard CAT5 connector because the radiator can exist on a, uh, a TCP IP network. That's for driving Ether Dream DACs or uh, other equipment down the road. And we also have a uh, HDMI output. This is 1080p at uh, 60 FPS. Uh, so you can use radiators without laser projectors. You can use them with uh, TVs. You can use them with video projectors in places where laser projection is not really safe or practical. And this kind of solves a lot, a lot of that problem. And it's also really useful uh, also for doing uh, video synthesis work. Uh, one use of the USB ports on the radiator is to hook a thumb drive up to so you can take the presets that you've made and export them to the thumb drive and take them out of the radiator for doing things like trading, for backing them up, and also for hand editing them. They're, they're just uh, text files. They're human readable, so you can export them, edit them, import them back in. Or you can also look at them and use them, away, use them as a way to learn how to build abstracts by looking at how other people have constructed theirs. So they're, they're super useful. Uh, when I'm using radiators, I also like to plug a little uh, USB gooseneck lamp into the USB port uh, to power it so I can see the console in dark situations. Uh, when when you're getting started with the radiator, kind of the, f the first controls that you need to be aware of are the master size and the master level. And that's these two controls here. Uh, master size, as expected, controls the size of the laser projection. And level controls the intensity of the laser projection. So it's really important when you're working with lasers to be safe, to know where the laser projection is, and to make sure the laser projection is away from other people and also um, use only the amount of power necessary to to visualize the abstracts just as another safety feature um, so uh, it's important to start here and once you start here then we can go on to actually using the rest of the console to make an abstract and the console is is split into many sections there are two shape generators here and that's important because many abstracts are created by combining something from one shape generator with something else from another shape generator. Um, and a lot of the old school abstracts require a frequency harmonic relationship between the two shapes. So as you start controlling uh, what shapes are being combined and the individual speed that the shapes are being drawn at, uh, you start getting instant interesting patterns like cycloids and, and Lisa shoe figures. Uh, you can certainly make abstracts with only the output from a single shape generator, but to make more visually interesting and complex abstracts, uh, adding in the second shape helps a lot. In the context of synthesizers, think of a shape as uh, maybe a sound that's stored in a wavetable lookup uh, in, in this case, that information is being used to draw an image instead of making a sound. But we have a lot of different shapes that are programmed into these that you can use standalone or combined. When combining one shape generator with a second shape generator, you don't have to use the same shape from both uh, shape controls. You can use a square on one and a circle on another or 
pretty much anything that you'd like. Sometimes that results in, in really interesting complex uh, images and sometimes it, it results in hash and you have to go back and say, okay, I like what's coming out of here, but combined with this, it's, it's not really usable. So let's choose another shape for one of the shape generators. So shapes are, are really generated um, primarily by either just taking the output of shape one and combining it with the rest of the controls or combining the output of shape one with the output of shape B. Um, and you can get some, some more interesting spirograph and uh, complex imagery if you're combining both of these and, and looking for a uh, harmonic ratio between uh, these two shapes. And, and we'll demonstrate some of that in a little bit. Once you've got something out of the shape generators, then you can use this section, which is the low frequency oscillators, uh, to affect the controls in the shape generators. Um, you can use these to control things like the size of the shape or the speed that the shape's being drawn or the rotation of the shape. And by doing that, you can put the radiator into more of a self-drive mode and let it handle the complex work while you're handling the fine tuning of colors and, and other motion and other things. The, uh, the shape generators have roughly 200 shapes built in. Some of those shapes are steel frames like this circle. Uh, some are animated sequences. Some contain their own color information. So there's a lot of flexibility here. Uh, to create a shape, all you need to do is turn the shape knob. You can turn it backwards or forwards and um, scroll through any shape that you might like to use. Uh, we're just going to pick a circle right now because circle is a really easy shape to look at and understand what's going on. Uh, you have a, a size control and then you have rotation controls and, and other effects. Um, but let's take this circle and let's combine it with a circle from a second shape generator. So I'm going to turn on shape B. And you can see that this, the circle from shape A is being affected by the circle from shape B. And you're starting to get a classic laser abstract pattern. And by changing the draw speed here, uh, you can find uh, the typical laser abstract harmonics and, and shapes that you might expect to find in another laser show. Uh, the radiator has some tricks up its sleeve as well. We have a sync button here that attempts to automatically find harmonic relationships between these two shape generators. So as I turn the, uh, the speed control, it looks to try to find uh, stable shapes without you having to spend a lot of time seeking these harmonies uh, when you're doing a show. Um, and also, there's an invert button here. And what that does is it changes the, the drawing direction of one of the shape generators. So you reverse the symmetry of the abstract that you're getting. And by changing the size relationship of the two shape generators, you can manipulate the shape even more. Keeping with um, standard synthesizer terminology, the radiator has three LFOs, which are low frequency oscillators. And these are basically a way to automate controls. Um, and LFOs can be used to influence any control on the radiator. And here we've got just LFO1 on, and you can tell by the light here that this LFO is on. And what we're going to do is we're going to use this LFO to influence the size of the shape that's coming out of this shape generator. So I'm going to turn the level up, and, and level on LFO just controls the amplitude of the waveform that LFO is generating. And I'm going to turn the shape control here, and you can see the shape is now set to sign. So this LFO is going to output a sine wave. And if we turn the speed up a little bit, you can see a graphic representation of the sine wave that the LFO is generating. And this is, this is very helpful because you can, you can see the speed, you can see the level and, and all the things that, that you need to know before you start applying it to another control. So now we need to route this information to the shape generator. And to do that, you just hold the select button down on the LFO 
And while you're holding that select button down, you can turn any of these controls and it will send this information to that control. In this case, we're going to use this LFO to control the size. So I just start turning the size knob and you can see the abstract is being manipulated and it's changing size in accordance to the information from this LFO. And I can turn the LFO speed down, which slows down the, the size, or I can turn the LFO up, which speeds up the size. To add to this complexity, we can take this LFO and we can apply it to the size of this shape and I'll just do that, turn the LFO on, turn the level up, turn speed to something, hold down select and turn size again. And you can see this LFO is affecting a different part of the abstract because it's affecting the size of this circle, which is affecting the shape of this circle. And um, routing in the radiator works as a one to many approach. So I can take this sine wave that this LFO is generating and I can also apply it to color. So now this abstract is changing color at the same rate that it's changing size. And I can slow this way down so you can see that that's actually happening. And this is kind of the heart of how the radiator works is creating an abstract and then using the LFOs to cause change and cause influence on the shape that you're creating. So not only does this information from the LFO uh, get routed to the controls on the board, but this waveform data also gets output from the, to the back of the radiator from the, the control voltage uh, ports. So you can take this voltage out, physically out of the radiator and plug it into another radiator. So you can control them both from a single LFO or you can use that control voltage to drive other synthesizers or uh, drive video synthesis equipment or just, just anything that's looking for that sort of signal. Um, and the signal range and voltage that we use is the industry standard for uh, control voltage. So there's a whole slew of other components that you can either use the radiator LFOs to control or because the radiator's got inputs, you can also take information from, from other components and send them into the radiator to use them to control uh, abstracts. So if you're a modular synthesizer person or you're building your own control interfaces, it's very easy to get data from your equipment uh, to influence things on the radiator side. So as you can see here, uh, I'm using the output of LFO2 to control the hue of the abstract which kind of leads us into a really good opportunity to talk about how the radiator handles color. So I'm gonna turn this off real quick so you can see what's going on. The radiator has two color modes. We support uh, both HSV, hue, saturation, value, and RGB, which is the more traditional red, green, and blue. Uh, currently the radiator is in HSV mode. So let's uh, jump to RGB and we can start there. So if I hit select in the color section, uh, on the display, we see all the information about how the color section is configured. And I can see here that the RGB mode is set to HSV. So I'm just going to scroll down to RGB mode and set it to RGB. And right now our output's white because we have red, green, and blue set up. So I'm going to start by turning down green and turning down blue. So all we're getting is the output of the red channel and that's what's coloring the abstract. And if we want another color, say we want yellow, we just start adding a little bit of green into that mix until we get the yellow color that we want. Or if we went, want violet, we just add a little blue into that red and start getting purples. Uh, this is quite simple. Uh, it should be fairly clear. We can also use uh, the output of the LFOs to control one of these levels. So I'm going to turn uh, blue back down until we're red. And then I'm gonna use uh, LFO2 to draw purple. So then you can see as the abstract changes, uh, you get flashes of purple in accordance to the waveform coming out of LFO2. 
and I can speed that up or I can slow that down and because I'm using the same signal uh, from LFO2 to drive color as I am to drive the size of this shape, everything stays in sync as I manipulate these controls. And now I can also take the output of LFO1 and use it to drive another color. So let's assign that to green. And you can see this abstract, uh, which has a base color of red, but you can see uh, green and blue come in based on what's coming out of the LFOs. And if I turn off one LFO, uh, you can see that it's just red and the green coming from here. Uh, the second color mode that Radiator uses is hue, saturation, and value. So I'm going to unmap the colors coming from these LFOs. So we're just back to a single color and that color being red. So if I switch the radiator to HSV mode, um, now the same controls represent the hue, the saturation, and the value. So if we turn the value up, we can get our shape back. And if we turn saturation up, we can get the color. But now since this knob is hue, as I rotate this knob, we cycle through the color palette. And you can see here a representation of that palette and a representation of our saturation. And in the same way that we are using RGB mode, the output from these LFOs can be used to control hue. So I'm going to assign LFO1 to hue. And you can see that it changes color as expected based on what this LFO is doing. And now I'm going to take value and when you turn value down all the way, your abstract goes dark. And I'm going to use the output of LFO2 to control that abstract. So now you're only seeing portions of the abstract, and that's based on the waveform from LFO2. So you can start doing some, some chopping effects that way. Uh, or you can use LFO2 to saturation. I'll unmap it to value. Turn value back up. So now the abstract flashes to white based on the output of LFO2. Um, there are some other color modes, and let's talk about them for a second. Uh, one, one very traditional uh, laser effect is a process called chopping, uh, and that's because of the old days of laser projectors. You're using ion lasers, which you couldn't just directly modulate off and on. So you would put a motor with the disc in front of it with holes in it, and that disc would spin through the laser beam and the holes would chop the laser off and on. Uh, fortunately, that's not something that we need to do these days, but we added chopping effects to the radiator so you can achieve some of those old effects. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this color section and I'm going to turn my modulation to chop and then I'm gonna turn modulation on. And now we don't get any output because these are, uh, when we move to chop mode, these get reset. So I'm going to turn on red, and then these controls became, become the chop frequency. So as I turn the chop frequency up, you start revealing only sections of the abstract based on how fast you're chopping and the relationship to how the abstract is being drawn. Uh, this might be a little bit easier to see as just a circle, so I'm going to do that. And now you can see what chopping is doing and how it's revealing only certain parts of that circle. And this is a very, very traditional uh, laser effect that you would see in planetariums and, and other shows. Um, and each of these colors has its own unique frequency for chopping. So I can turn on blue and I can set that blue chop to be a different frequency than the red chop and start getting some, some really complex chopped images that way. And by controlling also the speed that the shape is being drawn, uh, it affects the chopping pattern. Uh, and the radiator also has some, some kind of unique 
uh, built-in color, color modulation effects. Uh, so if we change this to X-Wave, for instance, um, then these three controls uh, control a different set of parameters. I'm going to make this stable so it's a little easier to see what's going on. Um, so for this X-Wave, the center control uh, acts as the intensity for that effect. And you can see we're beginning to get these bands of black running through the shape. Uh, and this control controls the velocity of those bands. And this control controls the frequency of those bands. So we can get some, some interesting effects uh, that way. And if we start adding that motion again, um, it becomes very interesting. We also have Y wave, which is the same effect, except the orientation of that chopping is now on the Y axis instead of the X axis. Uh, and we have X Y wave, which is a diagonal wave and X hue, which cycles through the color palette based on, uh, the horizontal size of the aspect of the abstract. and y hue, which is the same, except it's doing it on, on the y axis instead of horizontally. Uh, we also have this, this radial hue, which centers the color change uh, radially from center point, and that creates all kinds of, of really nice color modulation effects that you wouldn't see uh, traditionally. So we can do some really unique things just with a simple shape, a simple LFO, and some of the color modulation effects. Um, in this section of the radiator, we have a transform section. And transform section allows us to do 3D manipulations and, and other kind of special effects uh, on the output of the radiator. Um, and one of my favorite ones is the um, the quantize, which throws away some of the data and effectively reduces the resolution of the output abstract. And by turning that control up, you can see that it's beginning to take a nice smooth circle and crunch it down into something that's really unique. And, and this can also be controlled with an LFO. So you can do things like quantize to music, or if you're using an LFO to do color, you can also quantize to it and you can just get some very, very unique effects that way. Um, we also have some 3D manipulations in here and some other effects that are, are, I think, very interesting. On this section of the board, we have the cloner where you can take a single abstract or single shape and you can create multiples of that shape and you can animate those multiples to have them move independently from each other. So uh, I'm gonna start with something really simple, which is two clones. And then we can set the distance between the clones and the size of each of the base shapes and start to get some things that are very interesting. Also in the cloner are our rotations. So we can create, uh, an abstract from something very, very simple. And by adding cloning and, and motion, uh, we can get some, some pretty nice complexities. Cloning works either on the output of a shape generator or the combined output from the shape generators. Uh, it is just, it's just an, another module in the signal chain. So it happens after everything else on the board takes place. It happens after the shapes are created, after the LFOs are applied and after the color. It's, it's one of the last, uh, it's one of the last modules in the signal chain of how the radiator draws abstracts. And there's, there's, there's many different clone types and symmetries that are in here. Um, and some of them, as I said, uh, are animated. And then you can use a control here to control the rate of that animation. And as you can see, as we're rotating an object, uh, we 
are doing a full 3D rotation uh, and we do have some perspective applied to that rotation so it looks a little more visually interesting. Uh, so let's let's grab a shape that has some some depth information. Here's one. And by applying the rotation, you can see that we have a, a fully realized three-dimensional shape and we're rotating that shape in three dimensions. And you can see also how perspective gets applied to things that are rotating. And to remove the rotation, I can just hold down reset and turn the rotation knobs and it will jump back into the original uh, phase and the original rotation um, as the default shape from the shape library. The radiator is built to be a real-time performance tool. And the only th way that that could possibly be made to work is the ability to call up and save presets. So in real time, in a concert or a performance setting, um, you can jump from one abstract style to another abstract style very quickly instead of spending the time to build up an abstract based on what the music's doing, tear it back down when there's a music change and build a new one. So we've, we've added a lot of presets for you to get started. And presets are very, very simple to call up. We have a page here which cycles through pages and pages of abstracts. And you can see the abstract preview in the display here. And when you find one you like, all you have to do is press the button that corresponds to the abstract shown here. Um, it's very fast, it's very easy, it's, it's real time. And we've, we've provided quite a lot of uh, presets. The other thing about presets is they are user editable and user saveable. And as I mentioned before, uh, you can export all these presets to a thumb drive via the USB interface and uh, open the, that file as just a text file so you can reverse engineer presets or you can trade presets or upload them for other people. And it's very, very easy to create and save a preset. And I'll demonstrate that. I'm just finding a blank page in the preset file. Uh, Radiator supports multiple preset files. We call them show files. Each show file can handle up to a thousand presets and the radiator can store multiple show files at once. So if you're going to go out and do a gig to a certain type of music, you can edit a show file to abstracts for abstracts that just uh, will go well with that music. And so it's easier to go through the list of presets that you have and, and hit the right preset to what the music's doing. So let's create a preset and save it and call it up and you can see just how simple that is. So uh, one thing about the radiator is there's a lot of shortcuts uh, just to try to make operation a little bit easier and a little bit faster. And one shortcut is to reset the board to a default state. And we can do that by holding down shift and hitting reset. And now we've gone back to a circle which is the radiator's default shape and everything on the board is reset. So we're going to make a, a quick abstract like we did before using just two circles from the shape generators. And our shape is stable right now because both these shape generators are outputting at the same frequency. They're both outputting at 100 hertz. So I'm going to change the frequency of this one until we get a shape. And I'm going to invert it because I like things that are spiky and we'll apply LFO1 to the size here. And then we'll apply LFO2 to the size here. And it's important to remember that there's no real reason that I'm applying LFO1 to here. Any of these LFOs can be applied to any knob on the board. So uh, I'm just doing this by habit. It's easier to think of LFO1 to shape A, LFO2 to shape B, but it really doesn't matter. It's, it's your own preference. So now we have an abstract that we really like, and we've synced an abstract to music, so we need to figure out how to save it. And to save that abstract, all we have to do is find an empty preset bank, and then we hold down Shift, 
and we hit enter. And all the lights will flash on the console, which shows us that we're going to save the output to all the modules. And then we just hit a preset button and you can see a little icon of that preset has shown up here. So that preset is now saved in radiator's memory. And if we wanna go back and access that preset, all we have to do is hit the button that corresponds to that preset and we're back. So it's very easy to do this in real time. And often when, when I'm using radiators in shows uh, and I'm using the console and I create a shape that I've never seen before or that I really like or goes well with the music, I save it in real time while I'm performing so I can call it back either at a later performance or use it again during that performance. So it becomes really easy to build up shape and abstract libraries of things that go well to the kind of music that you perform to or just the kind of music that you, you listen to in your house or wherever you're using your radiator. So let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the menuing system in the radiator. Um, laser projectors are pretty fragile things and you have to be careful about what sort of signals that you're sending them uh, in order to not damage them. So in the output menu on the radiator, if you enter that, there are some controls to control the X and the Y size of the shape. I'm gonna turn this over to a square so we can see it a little bit easier. Uh, and also some controls to affect uh, the position of that shape. So if you need to, you know, if your laser projector's here and you need a shape over there, uh, you can use the X and Y offset to, uh, to move that image around a little bit to make sure that it's where you need to be. Uh, we have Y scale and X scale, so you can fit an object into the space that you need to project into. And just remember, um, it is possible to damage a laser projector based on what you're sending to that projector. So you have to keep the scale set properly. Uh, and there are plenty of calculators online to uh, calculate image size based on the laser projector scan angle. Uh, and it's, it's very important to pay attention to that. Uh, we also have maximum controls for red, green, and blue level. So if your laser projector doesn't have an excellent white balance, uh, you can go through and re-white balance it by changing these levels and also the bias controls. Uh, not all the colors in a laser projector come on at the same time. So by biasing uh, those colors, you get smoother fade outs and smoother fade ins and your laser projection will look much better. Uh, another thing to be very careful about is laser projectors don't like sharp jumps between corners of shapes or shapes that are too large, or even if you're using uh, things like ramp waves and square waves out of the LFOs, you have a motion and then you have a sharp reset back into projection, into uh, back into the default position. So we have put the we've uh, added some output filters to the radiator to help smooth those things out and help protect your laser projector. So here we have a square and in this menu we have an output filter and by changing the output filter you can see the corners of your laser projection round a little bit and the size round a little bit and that's the radiator saying uh, this motion is too violent or this motion is too big or too abrupt and so let's slow that motion down a little bit to make life a little bit easier for your laser projector. Uh, you also have some HDMI controls. Uh, as mentioned, the radiator can output directly to a TV or a video projector or a video recorder. Um, and using these controls uh, allows you to have a little bit more granularity on what the video signal is doing in relation to the laser output. Uh, you can set it so the video is always on, even if the laser's blanked. So you can use a video monitor as a preview and dial up your abstracts before you send them out to laser. Radiator also has MIDI inputs and MIDI outputs for being controlled uh, from external devices. 
So if you're using a DAW or if you're using a laser show editor package or anything that's got a timeline that you can send MIDI events from, uh, you can connect that to the MIDI input on the radiator and you can use that timeline to send preset changes or other control information to the radiator. So it comes, be, becomes very easy to start building uh, laser shows that are synced to music from timelines. Um, in the old Laserium days, uh, laser consoles had kind of a master data track that was sending course information to the console and then the operator was doing uh, the finesse work and kind of performing the show. But because there were, uh, because there was additional data being sent, um, the consoles would reset and the consoles would hit all the major beats and the ma major musical events. And the radiator is exactly the same way. Since you can send it commands from uh, a DAR or a timeline, you can sequence preset changes based on musical events and while you're doing that, the console is still live, so the operator can do, be doing uh, their interpretation of what should be happening between those events. So if you're doing that and get lost and, and end up making an abstract that doesn't go off the music, the radiator will reset itself next time you get a MIDI event and jump to something that works with the music and, and hit the music beat. Uh, I do a lot of show programming where I'm controlling multiple radiators from a timeline. I'm doing things like uh, switching presets. I'm doing things like color change and size change, all for MIDI data. Uh, and that allows me to have more hands than I would normally hand have, but it also allows me to, to absolutely time th radiator things perfectly with what I'm doing with the music. And it, it adds a whole new dimension of complexity and, and interest to laser shows. And it's a, it's a really fun way to control laser systems. And as I mentioned before, it kind of gives you the best of both worlds where you have a system that is guaranteed to be hitting musical events, but you are also live. And so doing these, these live sequenced hybrid shows uh, allows you to do show creation very quickly but it also allows a, a human operator some some live influence on the show. So uh, no two show performances need to be exactly the same. All the MIDI information, the MIDI mapping information uh, is in the radiator manual, which is available on the Neon Captain website. It's just a PDF because we love trees uh, and it also makes it easier for us to update in real time. Uh, you can grab that, use it directly off the website or you can save that PDF uh, locally, so if you're somewhere without an internet connection, you still have that reference material. And another thing to remember is all that MIDI data can also be sent to the radiator via a TCP IP network connection. So if you're a coder, you can write your own code to talk directly to the network stack on the radiator so you don't have to use a MIDI console. You can create your own surface or you can just create your own code to drive the radiator in exactly the same way. And that is a super powerful way to, to really customize what information you're sending to the radiator and what you're causing the radiator to do. The radiator is basically a synthesizer, but it's designed for synthesizing laser output instead of synthesizing audio. Uh, when you pull it out of the box, there's a little bit of setup that you should do. Um, we've got power cord, in this case, we're running a DB25, which is a standard ILTA connector to a laser projector, but this could also be just sent to a video projector or to a television or to some other video equipment from the HDMI out port. Uh, the first thing that you're going to want to do is set a master size and master gain, which is the size and the level controls here. And that's to make sure that your laser projection is not too big it's also to make sure that your laser projection is not in a place that um, is too close to other people because lasers uh, are dangerous and there's a lot of safety considerations that you have to take into effect. Uh, we have off offset, we have flip, we have scale and some color balance controls just to maximize the quality of your laser projection. Uh, they are all in the output menu. So if you double hit shift, 
uh, you'll get a menu here that you can scroll around and select output and then just hit enter and that will take you to that menu so you can do kind of that initial setup of color balance and size and position and intensity. The radiator has a lot of controls, buttons and knobs and, and, and all kinds of things. And um, it's really designed to be used live as a performance tool. And so we've added some shortcuts to make things a little bit easier and things a little bit quicker to use. Uh, one very important one is activated from the shift button. If you hold down shift and turn a control, radiator jumps from coarse mode to a fine adjust. So you can really dial in things and, and hit that music just exactly right. Um, also, we have the reset button here, and that's designed to reset the controls on the board. Uh, if you hold down reset and turn a single control, that brings that control back to its default phase and default speed. Um, if you hold down reset and hit select, that brings an entire module back to its default state. If you hold the reset button down and hit shift, that brings the entire board back to its default state. So if you get lost or you just want to start over, doing a shift reset or doing one of these shortcuts will save you a lot of time. Uh, you don't have to remember what the knob position was. You don't have to remember what was on and what was off and how things were routed because it just resets all of that for you. So it gives you a clean slate to start over again. And it's, it's very handy both in a performance space and when you're creating presets to use later because you can just make a thing, save it, reset, make another thing. And it, it saves you a lot of time and it just saves you a lot of, of wear and tear on your fingers uh, when you're trying to turn knobs.